glad it didn't start without me. Um, my name is still Michael, and uh, we're still doing the, the hybrid microservice stuff, or not. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Um, I'm really excited about the interest here. I hope uh, that I can live up to expectations. Um, if now the clicker would work, that would be awesome. Uh, in and out again. And switch it on, that helps. Yay. Okay. So, um, not sure if we're going to stick with that agenda though. Quick background to get everyone on the same page. Uh, a lot of hands on and then some QA. But do please interrupt me whenever you have a question. Don't wait for the end. Uh, it's just to give you a bit of time and some, some pointers that might be of interest. So, quick show of hands, please. Who is a sysadmin? <laughs> cool. DevOps. Don't be shy. Developer. Ah, okay. Architect. Now comes the interesting part management. Oh, come on. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Other. Whatever. Marketing. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Right. So, I promise to give you a full end to end overview and in depth about container, Docker, Masses Marathon, and Kubernetes. And let's get started. Otherwise, we won't get, get it done until we have the. How's it called? Eula? Eula Fest? Eula. Oh, yeah, no yeah. 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 So, who thinks that containers are the same, or should be treated the same as virtual machines? Good. My work is done. <laughs> so they're really for, for application level dependency management. If you're, if you're using Python, uh, virtual ends might be a good idea, right? Uh, so this is kind of really uh, making sure that your app has the right dependencies and you don't get uh, to live through the DLL hell or whatever hell uh, in terms of having the right dependency for your application. They're really very lightweight. Uh, you shouldn't think twice about you know, uh, launching a, a container. And we're going to go through some security considerations and then my favorite topic, pets versus cattle. Who has not, <coughs> not heard about pets versus cattle yet? Okay, cool. All right. So. Containers and you know, Docker containers, uh, including, are really just two things: namespaces and C groups. I've linked uh, the respective documentation there, but these two things, the namespaces, providing isolation on different levels, like process isolation, um, isolation of network resources, host name, file system, IPC, and the last one I graded out a bit because it's uh, rather new to Docker. Let's put it that way. And C groups uh, that really allow you to limit the amount of resources a container um, might want to consume. Now that looks like a lot of work, right? And indeed it is. And that is probably the reason why people, before that Docker came uh, and brought us this wonderful ecosystem, uh, didn't really use, other than Google probably, uh, use containers uh, in production. Now, what does Docker bring to the table? Well, essentially these three things, right? There is a registry, uh, a bit like GitHub, where you put your images. Uh, you can share it, you can pull from there. This is the kind of, uh, you know, your repository where you um, keep uh, the, the Docker images and such. I'm assuming that most of you have a basic familiarity with, with uh, Docker. So things like a Docker image uh, is not totally new to you. Then you've got the daemon here uh, locally. You do things like you know, Docker PS and run and images and so on. You can execute. Um, and then you've got the uh, actual containers, which, as I said, namespaces, C groups, and ch root. I've pulled out explicitly there because it's uh, rather important. And the Docker client uh, allows you to do that magic to pull uh, images from the registry, execute them locally, and also the other way around. You can build something and push it to the registry. And that ecosystem here. This is really the reason why Docker uh, is so popular, because it's now easy. You don't have to go in there and manually create C groups and manually manage the namespaces. That is kind of hidden away and made very, very easy for you uh, in, a, in a workflow style that we are already used to from, uh, from GitHub, right? 
A uh, couple of registry options. Uh, I typically suggest to run your own registry that has on the one hand performance reasons, on the other hand uh, the, the level of control is probably higher. Of course if you are like totally all in AWS or Google Cloud or whatever, uh, you might as well use their registries. Um, but as I said, uh, due to a number of, of different reasons, I typically suggest people to run their own registries. Are containers secure? Who thinks they are secure? <laughs> I would argue it depends on how you use them. So obviously, all these containers share one kernel, right? And there are, as I said earlier, uh, namespaces like the user namespace where only now we get this level of isolation we would um, probably expect. So that, for example, the UID 0, which is also known as root, is not the same in the container as outside, which makes life a lot easier. You can do things like locking down the networking. Uh, so, for example, if you don't need the containers to talk to each other, then just, you know, disable ICC. And last but not least, apply some common sense, right? It's not that hard. It's things like don't bake credentials, passwords, or keys, or whatever, into the image and then upload them on, uh, on the Docker app. You can do things like you can pass them uh, through environment variables or using secrets. Um, there are a number of specialized in-memory key value stores, such as uh, KeyWiz or Vault or Crypt, and uh, for certain container orchestration systems like Kubernetes, there are uh, native support for that. And that is actually that is the best option, right? It is a bit more work, but then at the end, you don't want to um, get into trouble with your like, networking security or whatever team there, right? Now, pets versus cattle. So in the, in the good old days, no matter if we had uh, bare metal machines or virtual machines, uh, we would treat our servers, our machines, as, uh, as pets, right? We would give them names, and if they would get sick, we would you know, nurture them back to, to health, right? Trying to treat each one uh, of, the, of the machines as individuals. With, with the cattle approach to, to infrastructure, it is really, they're all anonymous. They, they only have numbers. You don't really care if one of them dies. You just replace them. And uh, this is really the approach we're, we're using here. So because containers are so lightweight, because it doesn't cost anything to uh, ramp them up and throw them away, you're not, you know, one of the questions I often see on, on Stack Overflow is, how do I SSH into a container? How do I fix the container? If you don't, you just throw it away. You might want to um, understand what's going on there uh, to write a better Docker uh, file in the first place, but you do not try to fix a container like you try to fix a VM. Only recently I've uh, figured there are a couple of new entrants and I tried to come up with a term for it, so I said, let's call it flock of birds. Uh, you will hear things like per task computing, serverless is the most popular one, and Probably you've heard about that already, AWS Lambda. There are others as well, web task was already around for a bit, and a London-based company called StackUp. And all of them essentially do the same. They want to get rid of or getting you out of actually managing machines, no matter if the machines are full-blown VMs uh, or even containers. They hide that away, and they just ask you to you know, give them a Python or JavaScript or whatever uh, function or, or object or whatever. They're going to execute that and they go away. So this is the idea of being even more lightweight and you don't really deal with any kind of machines, virtual machines, containers or whatever anymore. We're talking about microservices, right? So one word of, of uh, caution here, a microservice per se is not something, you know, a silver bullet or something that solves all of your problems. Um, if you do it right, if you have the right team structure in place and the right attitude and last but not least the right tooling, but that's intentionally in the last, uh, last space, um, then you might be successful with microservices. But don't take them as a, as a silver bullet, right? Let's talk a bit about workloads so that we then get into the entire orchestration stuff. Um, these are, this is a continuum of, of workloads you will probably 
uh, already have seen in your production environment or you, you, you're aware of. So things like Batch, uh, we have their Chronos, good old MapReduce, Spark, which is uh, first and foremost a, a batch-oriented system that also can do micro-batching, which almost looks like streaming. Uh, Flink, which is actually the other way around, which is a stream processing framework that also can do batch. Then we have pure uh, stream processing systems like Storm, uh, Sums and others, and then we have PAS level stuff like Kubernetes and that. And ideally, in your environment, you want to be able to support all of these workloads, right? You might not have with each and every application all of them, and typically if we're talking about uh, microservices, we're very often in this space and there's one thing that I quite often get asked, and I say that already up front, very often we're dealing with more or less entirely um, stateless services. So web services, application service, whatnot, the state of the art in terms of dealing with databases, distributed file systems, and whatnot in the container world is, unless you're in a cloud environment, uh, not yet there, right? It's, it's, it's possible. It uh, requires a lot of hand-holding, but uh, so if you go for that, uh, if you want to containerize your workload, if you want to write microservices, be aware of that in terms of storage, in terms of stateful uh, services, um, you might want to be a bit conservative about that. Okay, now we're getting into this uh, domain of uh, container scheduling, container orchestration. Let's first start with the, the simple stuff. Let's imagine you're starting out with Docker. You're writing your Docker files and pushing the images into the registry, and then you're deploying them. Uh, let's assume that this is a cluster. Um, by the way, this, this uh, graphic at some point in time will hopefully be done nicely. It's from my upcoming book, and uh, the O'Reilly guys are working on that. So for the time being, this is the original. Um, so you have a cluster of machines. And some user comes here and says, oh, I want to you know, launch this app or this service. And uh, they might hand you over a, a Docker image. Right. So let's assume you don't have any automation, any software around that. Then your job, in this case, you would be the scheduler, would be to find a machine, and then maybe the, the user also says, by the way, I want three instances of this web server, right? So you're going to find three machines, you're going to SSH into these boxes and docker pull and then docker run these, or the, the, the image the user specified, right? What happens if that machine goes down? Probably, who was uh, DevOps or sysadmin again? You get paged, right? This machine is down. We need to read by it, restart that container somewhere else. So you go there at 3 a.m. in the morning, and go there, SSH into that machine, Docker pull, Docker run. So that sucks, right? That's why we have scheduler. A scheduler takes, um, there are you know, different ways of, of saying that, an application or whatever, finds resources, finds machines in the cluster uh, based on, on a number of, of different uh, requirements that could be utilization, that could be placement requirements, such as uh, you say, this container should run on an SSD backed machine or I need at least two gigs of RAM, or whatever the constraints might be. And then it runs it there, and when this container goes away, or the machine goes away, the scheduler somehow figures, and restarts that container somewhere else. That means you, as a DevOps or a sysadmin, you can sleep through the night, and uh, you have a guarantee there that the containers that make up your microservice uh, keep on running, as long as you want them to. There's actually a very interesting study by the Facebook guys. They uh, were wondering how well their, their container or their uh, orchestration system is doing, and they had a look at uh, the failure rate over the, the, the week and over the day, and they figured that uh, during the week and during the day, there are more um, outages or more, more failures, uh, probably because people are interfering with it, so the self-healing uh, capabilities of these systems is so good that if you don't touch them, just leave them running, they keep up everything, right? Obviously, you need to you know, do upgrades and you might need to uh, do other things there, maintenance, but overall, uh, the systems I'm going to talk about in the next couple of minutes uh, are 
that capable and that good that you can rely on them and you can say run that 15 times and it will keep it up and running as long as you like. Any questions so far? Everything clear as much. Perfect. Again, this is from my upcoming book. Uh, it's called Docker Networking and Service Discovery and I'm also covering all these different um, container orchestration systems. Just to give you an idea, if you, if you have a handful of nodes, right, maybe up to hundreds or whatever, you have a lot of, of different options. Uh, Nomad is, is early days. I uh, was at the container schedule two weeks ago and the CTO there said, uh, right now the CTO of, of HashiCorp that uh, pr produces or, or writes Nomad, uh, the Nomad is currently not yet, uh, it's 0.2, it's not yet production ready, it certainly <coughs> will get there. Um, Messes might be a bit of an overkill to set up if you have only a couple of nodes, but there are um, yeah, proof points out there that people with only six nodes or whatever uh, are using it in production. And the, the further you get there, like that would be Twitter, for example, or Apple or whatever, um, as of now, currently, uh, Messes uh, seems, Messes Marathon in that case, for, for uh, the long running services, might be a, a very viable option. Communities is getting there, getting uh, more into the scalability as well. Uh, Docker Swarm is, is uh, currently where we are. Does not really um, qualify fully, uh, at least in my books, because it does not restart uh, the containers when they fail. But I assume that this is also on their roadmap. This is a different look, not from the scale perspective, but from the kind of workload that we have there. If you're purely interested in, in Docker, which this uh, session here suggests, then probably that is not of your concern. So essentially saying all of them can do containerized work workloads. Um, and as I already said, stateful, uh, a lot of hand-holding, a lot of out-of-band solutions out there. Uh, stateless, no problem, you can do everything. So I like to motivate that one does not simply write a scheduler and that you Pretty please use one of the existence. Why? Because of that. It will backfire. <laughs> <laughs> so use Kubernetes, use Marathon, use Nomad, which is much better than writing your own. A lot of people start there. Um, I heard a talk, again, with containers scheduled in London from a guy from, uh, from Uber in, in Denmark. Um, and they, they are currently in the process of getting rid of their homegrown and migrating to uh, one of the, the established ones. And I think that's, that's fair if you start out that you probably, you know, trying to do something on your own. But, you know, you can take all of them. All of them are open source, right? Um, and you can extend them. You can, you know, fork them. You can do whatever you like with them. Uh, everything is better than, than writing your own. Uh, but <laughs> if you really must write your own, that's at least better than uh, manually managing containers. You really don't want to uh, manually, you know, ramp up your containers and, and keep them running it. So, Mesos. Uh, it's been around for quite a while now. I think 2010 was the, the initial um, code release and in 2013 in Apache. Uh, now used by quite a number of, of uh, yeah, well-known uh, companies. And this is really very, very low level, right? Mesos is really just um, a cluster, an abstraction for your cluster resources. It makes your entire cluster look like one big uh, machine. I always say jokingly, and I think I can uh, easily say that here, it's mainframes done right. right? It's like um, one big machine, one huge uh, you know, block of RAM and, and, and CPU shares and whatnot. And it acts as a kind of basic primitive for other schedulers that sit on top like Marathon. And while this one is from the original technical report, I'm going to walk you through how it looks like in a moment. The basic um, entity in, in uh, Mesos is the resource. So that's anything uh, that the task consumes. And the standard resources are the CPU, CPU shares, the memory, the RAM, uh, disk, and uh, the ports. And then in, in its core, Mesos has an algorithm that uh, is called DRF, or dominant resource fairness, which allows to uh, guarantee that the application or frameworks that, 
that then launch applications or jobs uh, get the resources they need in a fair way, uh, depending on, on what their uh, main purpose is, like if you have a very you know, memory bound or CPU bound uh, job, uh, then this will be guaranteed. So how does it look like? You have got, as in many places, uh, a Zookeeper cluster there where the Nessus master registered. It says, hey, I'm here. And all the slaves, and that's just agents as we call them now, uh, that's just a program that runs on, on one of your machines. That could be a virtual machine, that can be bare metal, it doesn't really matter. And they, they just say, hey, I'm here. So if you want to, this is a free node cluster. If you add a fourth machine here and start the slave, it will register through uh, through the zookeeper uh, with the mask and say, hey, I'm here, I'm, uh, I'm good to, to take on some work. Then one of the frameworks comes along, and that is specific to Mesos. It's a so-called two-level scheduler that essentially, as I said, Mesos itself only deals with resources. It only abstracts the resources, CPU, memory, ports, and, and this uh, away. And then the actual scheduling is done in so-called frameworks. These frameworks, uh, depending on, on the kind of workflow, uh, have different strategies. So, for example, Marathon is a framework that allows you to run long-running tasks, like a web server or whatever. Then there are other frameworks like Kronos, that it's for cron for batch jobs. Um, you want to execute this batch job every Monday morning. Uh, there are big data frameworks like Spark or Kafka or Elasticsearch or whatnot. So the actual scheduling decision is taking place here. And the framework, the first thing the framework does, it says to the message master, hey, I'm here. I want to do some work. And uh, then this uh, resource offer cycle kicks in. And that is actually the core of this DRF algorithm. Mesa says, hey, I've got, uh, I don't know, 82 gigs of RAM and 24 CPU shares here. Do you want to do something with it? And Marathon says, nah, I don't have anything to do. No, thank you. Get lost. But then there comes a client, right? That's you saying, hey, I want to launch this application. I'm going to go into detail and, and have a look at that, uh, how that looks like uh, in practice. For now, just believe me, it's, it's a JSON file that says, you know, execute this and this command. Once Marathon has got that, it will say, hey, actually, you know, the, the last thing that you showed me here, this resource offer, that matches actually the requirements I've got here from the so let's launch that, launch that task, right? And the message master says, oh, got this, uh, this uh, uh, application launch request from Marathon, so let's launch that task on this slave. And the slave, or agent actually, as we call it now, um, has an executor and within it a, a task and actually carries out that and always gives the status update to the master. And within message, there are only tasks. There's nothing like, like jobs or applications. Uh, that these are kind of um, yeah, abstractions that frameworks like Marathon or Kronos or whatever uh, then put on top of these tasks. Yeah, and, and Marathon can uh, query these updates or can take these updates and report it back to the client says, yeah, I've launched your, your little container here and the client is happy, hopefully. Now, as I said, Marathon being one of the most prominent and often used um, Frameworks, think of it as a kind of init system for the data center. So it takes whatever you say, runs it, and keeps it running. It has a couple of things like um, composition primitives, like you can group applications and scale those, uh, these groups. And then you have health checks. You will need to implement those health checks, but Marathon is able to uh, query these health checks and, and um, present it to the end user. And you can also do rolling upgrades, but uh, that's pretty much a standard feature now, I would assume. Just a quick preview, we're going to look into that later on. Uh, and now let's get to Kubernetes. So Kubernetes comes from uh, Google's experience in running containers, uh, reportedly some 2 billion per week, um, over a decade with the Borg system. So that's their internal scheduler. And it is really, if you look at the Borg paper and compare it with the Kubernetes uh, architecture, you will see one-to-one -one correspondences. There are a number of things that uh, Kubernetes has added, like uh, labels, which are now kind of backported or integrated in Borg again. Uh, but essentially, what Google did with that is said, OK, we have that experience with running containers at scale for quite a while. Uh, how about, rather than just you know, open sourcing our internal stuff, we do a complete rewrite, uh, add the, the best, best practices, the, the lessons learned, 
and, and you know, open source that in a, in a nice way. That's what, what they did with Kubernetes, right? So it is uh, for containers, right? So uh, you can, unlike Marathon, not launch currently at least uh, things like, you know, just Java program or shell script or whatever. You need to package it in, in a container. And that is how it looks like, right? Pretty familiar looking if you, if you remember what we had with uh, Mesos and Marathon. So you've got the master, uh, you've got cube control, which is the in one of the interfaces, uh, command line interface uh, for the end user. I'm going to use that in the, the hands on session. You've got scheduler, which is actually pluggable. So currently, for example, um, there is uh, the Firmament project, which takes uh, a different approach of scheduling and, and makes it available to plug in. Uh, there are things like the replication controller that allows you to uh, run a couple of, of, uh, of uh, pods or, or copies of pods of replicas. And then in each of the nodes, you have the cube lab that communicates with the Docker demon and um, makes sure that these pods are, um, are run. And then you can expose it through a proxy and interface uh, with the user there. This might look a bit, uh, yeah, uh, High level, but you once once we get to the hands-on session, you will see it's it's very straightforward. So the core concept: there is nothing like a container as as, as such. You only have pods. Uh, that's one of the lessons learned um, that from the Borg system um, that uh, rather than having single containers there, that you want to group certain containers together. The reason being that um, you want to make sure that certain containers that belong together are actually scheduled on the same node. So if you have something that I don't know, pulls some stuff from, I don't know, our example later on from S3 and a web server that serves that data, you really want to make sure that those two containers are scheduled on the same node, otherwise you're pretty much screwed. Labels, that's this uh, insight that uh, having any kind of static hierarchy uh, that you, know, you might prefer, uh, someone else from I don't know, the business side or marketing or whatever might not agree with. So why not having a flat um, mechanism identifying uh, things like pods or RC, that replication controllers or services. Uh, and that is just a label which is a key value pair. And that's really up to you. Uh, Kubernetes doesn't care. Uh, it's, it's you, the one who attaches some semantics to it. We're going to see some of the labels in action. Uh, for example, using it to debug a container pod um, online. The selectors essentially think of it like, like SQL um, match against the labels. So you say, give me all pods that are labeled with ABC or that are labeled with production. Environment equals production, for example. Controls, as I said, uh, replication controller, currently the only uh, example there, more coming up, uh, essentially uh, allows you to define this is what I, what I want to have uh, as a state. Remember, this uh, example in the beginning, uh, if you're the scheduler, if you don't have anything there like, like Kubernetes, then you need to make sure that the desired state, when the user says, I want like, three copies, uh, need to look, oh, we only have two uh, containers running, and the user said, I want to have three, so I need to launch a third one, right? And that is what the replication controller really does, right? You specify how many replicas, or think instances, or copies, or whatever you want to call them, uh, of a pod you want to have, and the replication controller makes sure uh, that exactly this number of, of pods is uh, run. And the services, uh, the final abstraction there needed to provide a kind of stable um, interface for the internal or external world because these pods come and go and uh, you need something uh, in terms of service discovery and in terms of being able to consume these services uh, that is stable, as a stable idea. So as I said, pods, this motivation behind it, I'm going to rush through that. I'm going to share that, that slide deck right after the talk, just for your, like, you can go through that in your own time later on. I said pretty much everything here already. And, yeah, uh, services, there's also uh, these two policies that might be on load balanced or headless. And, as I said, essentially it provides a stable working IP through these proxies. Then there are a couple of uh, cluster-wide services, things like monitoring, logging, DNS, and so on. And that depends on where you set it up. So if you have a, a cloud deployment, if you're, for example, in Google uh, Cloud Platform, then uh, you have certain uh, defaults there. If you deploy Kubernetes on-premises, then you need to 
you know, implement these things like monitoring. Typically, you would use things like C advisor for a single, um, a single container, um, or things like InfluxD plus Heapster uh, or Prometheus. Uh, logging, and so on and so forth. There are a couple of, of options for each of But just to remember, if you set it up on premises, you need to take care of that yourself. And last but not least, and now we're almost there uh, for the hands-on session, service discovery. So this is the kind of flip side of the coin. Um, the big advantage of these scheduler's is that you don't have to care about where a certain container is launched. Right? Uh, the downside is, how on earth should I know where a container is launched if I want to communicate with it? No matter if it's in a pod or like a single container in Marathon, somehow, no matter if it's from the outside world or within the cluster, you need to figure out what, where on which IP and which port this container is running, right? And that is actually uh, solved through service discovery. And as you can guess from this long list, there has not yet been a huge consolidation in that area. So there are a couple of uh, options available. Um, you can roughly group them into kind of old, kind of stable, DNS, and who knows. <laughs> to be fair, I mean, these are, again, this is from my book. It's, it's kind of like, yeah, they're very, very specific, but they, they have been built for a certain environment with certain assumptions, and if you have exactly the same environment with exactly the same assumptions, then go for it. Otherwise, you might want to use one of those above. Now we're already entering uh, the environment we're going to use in the hands-on session, which is uh, the DCOS, the Data Center Operating System. Just to give you a bit of an orientation, don't expect you to, to read that. If you really want to have a look at that, look at this bitly. Um, in the same way that a local operating system has things like a kernel, and memory management, networking, and so on and so forth, the same is true for the data center operating system. So it, it uses Apache Mesos as its kernel for um, abstracting the resources and, and scheduling, or, or re resource uh, abstraction, let us say. Uh, it has uh, things like Marathon and Kronos uh, that correspond to, for example, initd, and so on and so forth. So for each of the things that you see on the left-hand side in your local operating system, like Ubuntu or Red Hat or whatever, you will find something alike in uh, a distributed operating system like the DCOS. And that is actually what we are doing. We are uh, trying to uh, productize the combined experience our experiences our founders have running Mesos and Mesos related stuff uh, at scale in production at Twitter and Airbnb and other places and put that together in, in an offering that hopefully uh, allows you to you know, rather than doing this low-level stuff here, directly use these frameworks or services, as we call them in the DCOS, uh, such as Marathon, such as Kubernetes, Jenkins, Spark, whatnot, um, on your own. Benefits, obviously, are that you can run um, all the stuff that I talked about, stateless stuff, and uh, stateful services uh, together in one cluster, so you don't need dedicated clusters for, let's say, here you have your Nginx, uh, web server farm, and here you have a, a Kafka um, static partition cluster, but you can have essentially all of them in one. That also means that you can dynamically partition the clusters. So let's say that during the day, you say 80% of the resources should go to the web server farm, and 20% for some background Spark analytics job. And at 6 p.m., your local time, you switch over and say 50-50 or whatever. So you can dynamically assign resources depending on your business needs. And as a side effect, positive one I hope, is that you get typically the utilization, which is only true if you're using multiple things. So if you're only using, let's say, Spark or whatever, then yeah, you can only use so much uh, of, of the resources. But if you're using multiple uh, of these uh, services or frameworks, then uh, you get from this industry standard around 10, 15% uh, up to 80% or more utilization. So that's um, probably if you have 10 nodes, not your main concern. If you have thousands of nodes, then that might be of interest. And this is the last uh, slide in terms of the, the background, just to give you a bit of an orientation what you're going to see. So we have this master here. Uh, this is a DCOS uh, cluster. Uh, we're going to use the web interface and the command line interface. Then we have one public node. 
and a couple, I think five uh, private nodes configured. So I can only communicate with this one. If I want to communicate with one of them, I need to SSH into them. And that is set up in, in AWS for now. And now let's do some hands on. So, who remembers last week, Monday, there was a Slack outage? <coughs> who uses Slack? Yeah, you know? Okay. So there was a Slack outage, right? And I said, hey, Slack, um, how about, you know, you're using the DCOS? I can fix that for you. So let's fix Slack. <laughs> Obviously, I immediately looked for, uh, for um, open source. Um, ah, sorry. We're going to. We're going to time wise. Yeah, let's first do some, before we fix Slack, which is really just a one liner, let's first do something very, very, very simple. It literally is a one liner, a bit of some restrictions. So let's uh, have a look at Marathon Peak. I told you earlier on, can you guys see that? Okay. That the stuff that you are using to communicate with Marathon, where you say, hey, I want to use, I want to launch this, uh, this container or whatever, is a JSON encoded file, an application specification. And in this case, we're just uh, launching uh, Python 3, um, like a Docker image, just Python 3, and launch a web server that just uh, prints out the, the environment there. And we're going to launch that here and hope that the network works. That Good. And now we look at the uh, DCOS dashboard. So as I said earlier on, the DCOS, or MESOS, uh, allows you to see your entire data center, so the whatever five nodes we have here, five private plus one public, um, looks like one big computer, right? It looks like one big machine with 24 CPU shares, 82 gigs of RAM, and no failure support. Um, and per default, Marathon is installed there, so I can look into Marathon. Hopefully, it has uh, launched this, uh, deployed this little peak thing. So it takes a bit because it's now going to pull the image from the Docker Hub, and then, um, yeah, once it's there, you can actually use it. We are launching this, this marathon app, right? This is necessary to uh, constraint. If you remember in the scheduler uh, overview, you can specify constraints. Here I say, please launch it on the public slave, otherwise um, we'll have hard times to actually um, ping it or to actually see something. And here are some uh, resource constraints there. And this is the ID I'm using here. So let's see. Yay, it's running. So, here you see why service discovery is important, right? I said here, container port, right? Expose the container port 8080, and that is Marathon speak for, I don't care to which port you're mapping that, right? So I said, give me some port, you have a port range, give me some port that's free, and why does that make sense? Why, why does it oftentimes make sense to let the container orchestration system pick the port for you with the, the downsides, we, we need to talk about that, right? We need to, when, when the orchestration system picks the port for you, then you need to somehow figure out which port the application actually runs at. But why does that make sense? Any idea? Why does that make sense? Because if you don't know where the application is going, you are not sure that the port that you want is actually free. That is a very good one, but if I only want to have one instance, then it's not a problem. But if I want to have 10, and all of them want port 8080, that doesn't <coughs> Work, right? So if you if you only have ever one instance, then who cares? If you have multiple, then it is. so now I need to figure out where the um, where the public slave is. Pretend you haven't seen it right now. And we set port twenty three one forty four. Now let's see if I yay enough. Uh, Demogod appeasing. So that's that's actually what it all is doing, right? It just says literally um, dump the, the environment and serve that, right? That's that's all it is doing. Okay. Um, right, that was fun. Next, 
we're gonna launch something more. How am I doing in terms of time? We still have an hour, that's fine. Let's do that. Um, let's do something more interesting, C Advisor. So C Advisor is this little interesting thing that allows you to get quite some insight about what's going on in the container. Uh, again, pretty similar setup to the first one. Uh, just pull the image from here, um, it exposes it on a certain port, and then it does a couple of, um, of uh, mappings. So, you know, map slash to rootfs, map uh, bar run to this path in the container, and so on and so forth. So that you have visibility and insight uh, to that, or, or C advisor has that. So let's deploy that. Okay. And again, same holds true. Let's keep that here. Um, takes a bit until, oh, it's already there. I must, must have done already in the, in the dry run. Uh, 26368. So this, this alone is not very useful, right? It's, um, it's just the view of a single uh, container there, really. Uh, but if you're using things like Prometheus, for example, where you get the overall view, uh, then you know, it might be quite, quite useful for you to monitor your overall system. Just to, to make the point, right? Uh, let's destroy that. It's, it's, you know, this is real, right? If I reload that now, it's gone, right? <coughs> Kill that container, gone. Um, and again, if you have any questions, please interrupt me at any time. You're specifying CPU setup load. How does it translate to the actual course? Right. For example, right. the 0.1. Right, right. So that's 0.1 shares, right? So if you have, um, let's say, 10 cores there, right? Then 0.1 times 10 would be one full CPU. Depends on how many cores you have. Okay, now already, as I said, let's fix Slack. Uh, for that, as I said, there is this wonderful uh, open source version of Slack called Mattermost. Um, and if we look at the uh, marathon application specification again always the same thing you know make sure that it's available on the or scheduled on the public slave or agent and um, this is the, the, the core of it right so get that from docker hub uh, exposed port 80 uh, it actually needs two gigs of ram first uh, when i first tried to fix like i uh, <laughs> didn't specify enough it didn't come up it's like ah. and then yeah i figured it needs a bit more um, yeah, so let's, let's deploy that. So this one has an interesting feature. The reason is not you know, to, to um, show off or to, to paint Slack in, in, a, in a bad light. I'm a, I'm a huge Slack fan and, and uh, you know, consumer. But the point why I'm, I'm, the reason why I'm showing you MetaMost is that it comes with a uh, underlying MySQL database. And while here, Gonna, again, wait until it has pulled the, the Docker image. Here, for example, with this peak, I can say, you know, I want to have 10 of those, right? I want to have 10 instances. And Marathon will go and ramp up 10 um, instances, right? It would take a bit because depending on where, where it finds resources, no problem, right? Uh, I will have 10 of these stateless things and I can you know, go to each of them and, and um, well, all of them will be in the public slave because I have that constraint there, but uh, it will happily do that. What do you think what happens if I do the same with the uh, MetaMost thing? Again, remember, there is a MySQL database included there. So let's see, 17,183. What do you think will happen if I scale that? Yeah. So feel free, try me at that. Create team, you the awesome. Whatever. Just to demonstrate you that there is really uh, a database running somewhere. Yes, it's correct. You the day of Dr. Awesome. Okay, so feel free. Here's the. Oh, fuck. 
Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> throw it away anyway, anyway, uh, so that's there, right? So that was very, very easy. Um, looks a bit like Slack, feels like Slack. And, you know, feel free to join here. Um, no worries, I'm going <laughs> to throw it away in five or ten minutes anyway. So. And it's not, not required, right? So, you know, go ahead and, and, and have fun. So what's the problem? If I now say here, scale, right? Scale to five. Will that work? You say no. Who, who thinks it will work? You just said no. Yes. <laughs> oh, you're in management, right? <laughs> Sorry? It depends. Yeah. Very good. So you have some technical background and moved into management. <laughs> yeah, I do. Very good. Um, you're, you're right, it depends. Uh, well, it will work, but you don't get what you would expect, you don't get one big metamost instance, but you get 10 or 5 single, separate ones, right? What neither Mesos nor Marathon, nor Kubernetes, nor any of these things does for you is automatically and automatically shard your MySQL database, right? So you need to take care of that. Uh, there are options, there are things like Flocker and, and um, MC Code and others have, have things. Just to say that's in the beginning where I said stateful stuff is kind of like, hmm, you can do it, but you have to take care of certain things yourself. So if you figure a way to shard that MySQL database, uh, if you're using a distributed file system or whatever, then you're fine. Uh, but don't expect that Marathon or Kubernetes or any of those does that automatically for you. So stateless, no problem. Stateful, that is exactly the problem there. Okay? So, anyone tried? No? Everyone is listening? Everyone is sleeping? Okay. Cool. Um, next, we fixed Slack, sort of. Well, it's just you know a matter of adding machines here, right? I can certainly sustain some uses. Now, next topic is Kubernetes. I um, wanted to show um, how to do stuff in Kubernetes as well. Uh, for that, I need to install Kubernetes in the DCS. So I need to do a couple of things for now, which is not cool. Right, it should be easier. Um, we have this concept of universe and multiverse. Universe, essentially a GitHub repository that contains all stable stuff and multiverse stuff that we're currently working on making it stable. And in order to have HA, I'm going to also install etcd in the cluster. Yes, 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 I want to install that for sure. Blah, 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 okay. And now I need to configure etcd. Nano. Okay, so that's where I can tell if I'm at a mainly developer or a mainly ops conference. If I do that at an ops conference, then people laugh at me for using Nano. Um, and we're going to install. Yes, I want to. Now I've given that, that part really off enough that I know I will have to wait for a couple of minutes because now it's going to deploy Kubernetes and before that I can't do this. If I do that right now, it will say blah blah blah, can't download it because Kubernetes is not yet running. Kubernetes in the DCOS is also launched through Marathon, so this, this Marathon instance that's there is essentially, as I said, uh, the init, init D, everything is launched through that. Etcd has is already there. That's fine, and we should very soon hopefully see uh, Kubernetes as well. Let's see again. Marathon. Yeah, deploying, deploying. You know, it's like one of these XKCD. What are you doing? Deploying. Yeah. Okay, deploying, deploying. Okay, let's have a, a preview of what we're going to do with uh, Kubernetes. So the first thing again. Very, very simple. We're going to uh, launch an Nginx web server, which has these two components, the replication controller. Remember, that's the thing that keeps the pods running as many instances or replicas in the Kubernetes speak as I like, and the service that provides a stable uh, interface for that service. And in the meantime, voila, Kubernetes is there, and I can actually hopefully see it there. Yay! Uh, that went well. And, um, Anyone here? Still not. Huh? You want to see Kubernetes? Um, so let's 
deploy the web server, right? So everything's there. I can have a look at the cluster anyway, or the cluster as such. Just gives me uh, first installs kube control um, as a subcommand and then uh, gives me the overview. So if you want to just mentally remove the BCOS for now, then uh, everything that's on the right hand side is, is just standard uh, Kubernetes and kube control thing. <coughs> So let's uh, install this nginx web server. Right. So we have, as I said, this service defined here. It's a service. We call it web server SVC. So for most of the old things, Kubernetes has long and short forms. So endpoints would be EP, and replication controllers would be RC, and so on and so forth. And SVC, as you might have guessed, is service. And expose uh, that port AD. Or, or uh, yeah, expose it, and, and this is the, the replication control, and this is really just the, the pod uh, specification. So you want to run nginx in the version 1.9.7. Again, that's a reference to uh, the Duck Docker um, hub, and expose that for me. So let's do that. Let's first get the uh, service up and running. So here, tell Kubernetes through kube control. Create something based on that manifest, that YAML file. And then uh, the same for the underlying uh, replication controller. And now I can say DCS cube control. Let's see if pods or the pod uh, has already uh, still pending. Same as we have seen earlier on with, uh, with Marathon. Obviously, it first needs to pull uh, that NGX <coughs> image and very soon, yay, it's already running. Right? And we can do the same for the replication controller, so we would expect one replication controller with the name we specified. It's there. And it has a couple of labels. You remember that one early on? Labels, right? Those are labels I defined. It could be, I don't know, mood is tired or whatever. Is that a mood? Um, this, this has no meaning to, to uh, communities at all. Right? This is just what you decide uh, to label things. So you could have things like environment, production, environment, development, or blue-green, or for a certain product team, or for whatever, right? as many labels as you like. And uh, then you can select parts, and we're going to do that in a moment for debugging purposes. Uh, the service, so we would expect one service, right? Hopefully. Um, there are actually more. These are system services that you can forget them. Those are uh, specific to, to our implementation. So the only one that is of, of interest here is is the last one, right? That's the one, the service. Um, but I don't really find that very, very interesting. I find the the endpoints more interesting. Or end. that's why. That's exactly why we have short forms like EP. Uh, so in fact, what is there now is this endpoint, right? So ten twenty five. Um, now I would need to. Look it up. Where is that? Where's my cheat sheet? There it is. Web service. SVC. Not found. Web server. Yeah, well, whoever can type. Yay, so Nginx is there, right? Now, um, if you look at that, we specified we want to have one replica, right? One copy, one instance of that Nginx web server. Now let's scale it. Let's say we want to have three of those, and that's pretty straightforward with scale, very surprisingly. So you say, please, dear Kubernetes, uh, through the uh, replication controller, I want to have three instances. Now, if I say get pods again, what would you expect? How many pods would I see now? Four. One? Who is for one? Two. Three. You're right. It's three. Obviously, because I said I want to have three replicas. Just replace replicas with instances or copies of that pod. If I say scale 3, I can say scale 10, I don't know. 
um, it actually means I want to have 10 copies of that specification, right, of that part specification. This is the part I'm specifying here, or one of the containers in the part, let us say. And I said, I want to have 10 instances, 10 copies, 10 replicas of that. Right. It will probably take a grip, I guess. Oh, or, or run one. Okay, fine. Right. Now, for some fun, let's say, which, which one is the, is the nasty one? Let's say, okay, we labeled them with uh, status serving, so I would expect that if I say, give me all parts that are labeled with status equals serving, so key equals value, then I see all 10 parts, hopefully, yes. Now let's say, which one? This one here, right? This is a part that is troublesome, right? So this is a, a bad part, gone bad, bad. Pot gone bad, or got pot gone bad, bad. So this one, oops. Let's assume this one has some issues. I don't know, no health checks or whatever. So we're gonna label that one. Um, and say status is troubleshooting. Right. I'm going to relabel it from uh, status is serving to status is troubleshooting. Now, here comes the big question. If I say it again, let me. If I now say again that, how many pots will I see? Ten. Who's for ten? Don't be shy. One, two, three. Who's for nine? Okay. Whoever said nine, no beer tonight. <laughs> <laughs> or I drink your beer. Why? Well, we have the replication controller. We set the replication controller to ten. I took one of the pods offline, or I labeled it differently, and the replication controller in here actually says, Right? Selector, sorry. Obviously everyone saw that. <laughs> just, just kidding. So, uh, it has to fulfill both. It has to have the label apps web server and the, the, the label status serving. Then the replication controller acknowledges this is a part under my control. I changed it for that one part and uh, I can actually prove it, right? I can say, give me all that are non-serving, which is a very clever way to say the troubleshooting, uh, and that's the one we have. Right? And now I've taken this pod out of the, the service, I can you know, debug it or whatever, do something with it, and the replication controller makes sure that I always have the 10 specified. Um, the same would actually happen if I, if I kill one of those, right? If I say, ECS, cube, control, Lead pod blah. and uh, so the first one should be replaced by or this one, yeah, you see H for a second. So it immediately started up another one because I told it I want to have ten replicas, ten instances, ten copies. Right? And if you bring back the one that's been troubleshooted back with it, the What do you think? The other one the one of those ten should be killed, right? Okay, let's do that. Very good. And uh, uh, which one? So again, let's let's. Uh, you don't know. So it's around. Only only communities. Communities and, <laughs> and Google. Um, again, let's see the ones who are serving. Expecting ten, right? Eleven. Well, the first one. Whatever. Um, now let's relabel that one with serving and yeah, again eleven. Right? Now we should see this one again here. Right? Kill some other. It will, no matter if they're not enough or too many, it will. Do what you said you wanted to do. Ten, not more, not less. Okay, 
Um, next to some. By the way, yeah, I've, I've, I've put that um, this uh, logging exercise here on, on the Kubernetes resources page for for uh, uh, if you want to try it out as well. Um, and maybe a bit more interesting in the context of uh, hybrid, right? So far we have done marathon on its own and Kubernetes on its own. Now we are really doing something hybrid for the last. I have a quick question. Yes. What would make a container crash? Who? What would make a container not crash? <laughs> <laughs> so containers are really just very, very like think of it like a like a process, right? What can make a process crash? When I think of Java, things like garbage collection comes to mind. Um, anything, anything that what kills a normal process, right? That's it. Uh, <laughs> Well, you have, yeah, you're launching that one, typically, one of the best practices, the good practices, that you right. have one process per container. Exactly. And so you, you have several processes in a container? Well, it depends. It, it depends, like, as I said already, with Marathon, the same is true for, for Kubernetes. It's your responsibility and your definition of when is a pod or a container healthy. So you will have, you will implement a health checking saying, um, you know, slash health or slash status or whatever, um, if on that URL, I get a 200, HTTP return code 200, then I consider that healthy. Um, it's up to you. If, you know, whatever, you, whatever logic, it, it probably depends on what kind it is. If you have, um, let's say, MySQL uh, database, that might be something different to something stateless or whatever. Uh, as I said, depending on, on what it is, you might put more or less effort in there, but I would go for, let's throw it away and start a new one. Right? It's, it's so, especially for, for um, stateless stuff. It's so cheap. To, to start them, don't, don't bother trying to you know, fix something there. I just want to, and, and especially at scale, there's that one nice uh, demo that also John Wilkes gave of Google uh, Omega fame, uh, where he launched in Borg something like 10,000 uh, copies or replicas or whatever, um, and it never re really reaches the 10,000, but at that scale, it doesn't matter if it's 9,995 9, or 10,002 or whatever, it just, you know, at that ballpark. Obviously, it makes a difference if you want to have two, three, or five. Right there, you, you do care uh, about that. Right, so the time series, um, the real hybrid thing. So we've done a uh, little demo um, that essentially looks like this. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see it nicely, but... Oops. Oh, as good as it gets. So it looks a bit complicated, but really what it is, is a hybrid microservice architecture. So we have um, some crime data, and this crime data has some interesting properties. It has both a spatial and a temporal uh, dimension. So it has, which is a very elaborate way to say, uh, it has timestamps and it has geocoordinates. It's up on GitHub available, so you can just go there and try it out yourself if you want to. We picked the crime data from the wonderful city of Chicago. I don't know why. Um, and put that 600 megabyte dump uh, and turned it into a streaming source. So essentially reading one line and then just spitting it out, stuffing that into Kafka and having a Spark streaming process that essentially reads it out and applies some logic to it, uh, aggregates it for this uh, heat map here where you can see the density of, of the crimes and uh, through InfluxDB, a time series database in Grafana. Uh, the so-called online part that shows the distribution or the, the intensity of certain crimes over time for the last, I think, retention time was one hour or whatever, where this is really the entire historical data for the entire uh, period. We're going to focus on this part, on the Kubernetes part here, because it has two interesting properties, and the, the first one is the secret. So who has heard about Kubernetes secrets? Okay, great. You remember that part where I earlier said, don't bake your credentials, no matter if they are passwords or access keys, like in that case, it's free, into your image? Now, Kubernetes makes it really super easy to, um, to do that um, in a very, very secure way. Uh, I blocked about that, and again, it's, it's for this uh, K8S info site available, which walks you through all the steps that are necessary. It's not totally straightforward. There are some things you need to be aware of. 
like how the key must be structured, you need to base 64 encode the value yourself, and so on and so forth. But I hope this stepwise you know, um, tutorial helps you to, to figure out how, how you do that, and it's worth the effort. So let's do that. I'm obviously not going to show you the secret there, because that contains my actual S3 or AWS credentials. Uh, let's just deploy it. Now. You control get secrets. And we hope. Yay. So it's an opaque thing, right? So we don't really see it uh, unless we SSH into it and look at it. And it's essentially made available as, as a subdirectory and, and, uh, and uh, uh, file. And now we can uh, deploy it again. The same we did, we did earlier on with the Nginx web server. And service, we have uh, here a replication controller for the offline part and service here. Again, this is really just this part, right? The ES3 fetcher and uh, the Nginx powered website. And this is really a very, very good reason why we're using Kubernetes for that part. Because these two things, they must be on the same machine. Otherwise, this Nginx can't read the JSON data the S3 fetcher has pulled from, from S3 bucket. So you really want to make sure that these two things are, these two containers are scheduled on the same machine, because then you have within the pod, um, yeah, you can see each other through a network and have a shared volume there. So that is, as I said, a service, and that is the uh, replication controller. And uh, this is the replication controller defining these two uh, images. So in this uh, sense, uh, we have a pod with two images, the S3 fetcher and uh, the UI, the Nginx-based UI. Um, so let's deploy the service. Oops. And then the replication controller. And then let's have a look at the <coughs> endpoints. Okay, let's see if the pods already came up. Yeah, still pending. You see that here, right? Needs to pull uh, both images now, the S3 fetcher and the <coughs> Nginx. And there it is. And now we are also interested in the service, in the endpoint. And there you go, you have it here, 1026 offline reporting service. So hopefully, if I now go to the Kubernetes, yay. Okay, the bucket is empty because I haven't started the, the rest of it. I need to start all of that. I'm not going to do that right now um, in order to fill that bucket. But you know, what it actually has done is with so the the, um, the replication control at uh, the pod here. Close that kind of confuses the heck out of me. This pod, this uh, UI, the, the Nginx instance essentially, um, expects the, uh, sorry, not the, the Nginx, the S3 fetcher here expects the um, AWS secret uh, in order to be able to pull from that uh, S3 bucket, right? That is exactly what I've done here. So to, to the uh, S3 fetcher container, uh, under this directory, it will find the credentials, and with that it can go uh, and fetch from or write or whatever your whatever your settings are, um, and that, that's a very secure way because nowhere, uh, unless you obviously put the, the secret itself in, into GitHub or whatever, uh, nowhere your credentials show up, and uh, you have a very safe way. The same way you would expose you know, MySQL database using a password or whatever. Okay, and that's pretty much it. If you want to follow along, then. I think I have it here on the board. Yes, we did that. So what I did there, if you go to that address, that is a gist, which, oh, look at that, but it's, 
not that hard. And this cluster that you currently see will stay up for another, I don't know, three, four hours. Let's see. Expires in three hours, 49 minutes. We have now three hours, 49 minutes to play around with that. Feel free to totally screw it. I don't care. I'm going to throw it away afterwards, so it's going to self-destruct anyways. Um, if you want to go there, just click on that. So the sequence was, you go there. This will lead you to this gist, which is secret. Don't share it unless you want 100,000 people out there to use it as well. Uh, if you click on that, you should get to the uh, to the dashboard. Yeah, that was very clever. To this dashboard, right? And you can ignore this first uh, where it asks for the email address. You can you know, put whatever in there, and and there you can do whatever you like, right? You can kill all of them manually. Or, maybe more interesting, if you directly want to do what I did here with the command line interface, you first will have to install the command line interface, which is a Python-based setup that has all the, the right settings in there. Okay, so if you want to do that the next couple of hours until the big drinking game starts, you can do that. Another half an hour, not that. Any questions so far? Everything clear as mud. Perfect. So, from where we are, the question is always, where can I learn more? In the following, I'm going to show you a couple of resources that I personally found very cool, very useful, and also others I talked with um, confirmed that. Both of them, because Docker is so simple to learn, uh, you don't start here, you start somewhere here. So if you are mainly interested uh, in what's relevant for, for the production, putting it into production, uh, this book, and that is general purpose from you know, DevOps to, to Ops or whatever. Uh, Adrian of Container Solutions, he did an awesome job there. So both books really for like pure Docker, also covering a bit other areas like, as I said, uh, Kubernetes, Mesos and so on, but mainly, mainly Docker core. If you're interested in Mesos, Marathon and so on, this one would be more for developers, DevOps. This one would be more for Ops guys. So if you Want to set up a cluster? You want to buy that one? Buy it. Don't don't pick some shitty. Um, or uh, more, if you want to write a framework or application, whatever. Uh, this one. As I said, don't don't bother uh, noting anything down. I'm gonna upload it right afterwards, anyways. And in terms of Kubernetes, uh, Kelsey, who is probably around later on when he supposed to give his keynote, uh, wrote this wonderful book. Um, Another book by a Googler, which is actually free, very short, like 30 pages, but also gives a nice intro. Um, it's that, and that's my main book. It should be a bit of rather softish. And then there are pages like uh, p24e.io, which stands for programmableinfrastructure.io, uh, and because that's such a horrible long word, we decided to shorten it to p 24 And the same for Kubernetes, community uh, resources. Uh, where also the the, uh, the recipes are. Okay, and uh, with that, I'm opening up to QA discussions and 